Hi everyone. Good evening and welcome to the live stream today. Very much excited for having you on the day two this week as we continue with our discussion towards the ICAD November 2020 examination. I'm very much excited about today because we continue with our discussion on the consolidated financial statement. One of my personal favorite topics in corporate reporting, in financial reporting, in advanced financial reporting, SBR, strategic business reporting, and any other uh, accounting issues in that case. And I see some of you guys joining the stream on YouTube as well as on Facebook. Welcome to the stream. Put in the chat box. Let me know uh, if you have any questions for me. Let me know where you are also watching from. And let's give some shout outs to you guys. And thank you very much. Smash the like button when you join the stream. That way, we also get more engagement on the stream and you will be able to uh, get the assistance you need in order for you to prepare well for the examination. So welcome to the stream. I see some of you guys uh, joining the stream. Welcome. Welcome from Facebook, on YouTube, um, and all of that. Come in, come in, come in. Okay, so let's go through your comments. Uh, Carlos Robert said, I'm already here. Also, Carlos. Um, Kennedy uh, Onyango said, much love from Uganda, the pair of Africa. Much love, Kennedy, to you as well. Uh, Abiodan Ogunkela, forgive me for your name. Abiodan, let me stay with that before I go and mention some things that I'm not supposed to mention. But hey, Abiodan, good evening. Hope you're doing well. Um, Jonas Wittini said, hello, sir. Hope you're doing well. It's a long time. I don't follow to uh, your live stream. Yes, uh, Jonas, I hope you're doing well. Um, Shruti Akai, uh, forgive me this name, I can't mention all of them, but uh, Nagari Nagajuna, forgive me, but I'm not live. I don't know what you mean by not live. Uh, Joseph Menta said, good evening, Shira. Yeah, Eric, good evening. I'm doing well. I hope you are doing well. Minmo, Queno, good day. Uh, it's pre-recorded. Hey, this is not a pre-recorded lecture, please. It's a live lecture, you know. I'm reading your comments live, so you, you have to know that it's a live lecture. Michelle Ban said, good evening, Ishira. Good evening, Michelle. Uh, Minmo said, uh, thanks for this initiative. Always a pleasure. Eric said, God richly bless you for the service to mankind. Amen. God bless you too for the support. Um, Ethieni uh, Onyahu said, excess love from Lagos, Nigeria. More love for my Nigerians as well. I know that you guys are still here with us. Um, Ruth said, good evening. Good evening, Ruth. Hope you're doing well. Uh, he said, hi, I'm a chartered accountant from India. Oh, okay. That is good. Welcome to the stream. Henry Tete Brigade, what? Okay, let's stay with the Henry, so doing well. Comment in the chat box, let me know any questions you have for me. We are gearing towards the ICA November 2020 examination, and our executive revision masterclass is actually starting next week, Monday, 9th of November 2020, from next week, Monday, 9th of November 2020, to uh, 28th of November 2020. We're going to have serious morning and evening sessions via Zoom, and also you'll be able to get access to our online study portal and get a content of everything that we have covered so far in order for you to prepare well for your examination. Funny enough, we just launched a new project called The Dawn Project, where we are doing from 2.30 a.m. to around 4.30 a.m. and practice some questions, and it's already getting interesting. I love uh, my students a lot with the commitment that they are showing from yes, uh, we started yesterday and the love was too much for that. And so we're going to continue with that. And this is some of the things that you get if you study directly under my mentorship to prepare well for the examination. And this is going to continue till 28th of November as we wrap up for the November 2020 examination. So if this is something you are interested in, it is 250 Ghana cities per paper. 250 Ghana cities per paper. You can call or WhatsApp 050 114 9296. 050 and get mentored studying under my mentorship directly to be able to prepare well for the examination. So, hey, 
Let's go into the discussion real quick. Francis Akin said hi to you, sir. God bless you. Hello. God bless you too. I see some of you guys joining. Smash the like button when you join. Smash the like button when you join. If you are watching and you have not smashed the like button, man, what are you waiting for, man? Smash it. I'm waiting for you. Do it. Do it right now. Just smash it. It doesn't cost anything, right? So smash the like button. That way the YouTube algorithm picks the video up. Boom. And we'll be able to get a lot of students watching this great content and being able to get access to the channel in that case. Thank you very much for the support. I love you so much. For those of you who have been sharing the video with your friends on our social media platforms, like subscribing to the channel, commenting on our videos. Really, really love what you are doing for us. And may God bless you and continue to bless you as we assist you to be able to prepare well for your examination. And most importantly, take your life to the next level. So yesterday we started with consolidated financial statements with the key principles. We saw the various issues that we need to understand when it comes to uh, what is consolidated financial statements, what is subsidiary, what is significant influence, what is control. Then from there we went through or we began with the principles of consolidated financial statements, starting with the issue in relation to uh, the group structure. But I showed you that there are five steps that we're going to go through generally when preparing a consolidated financial statement. And I also stated that you've got to make sure that you don't put any pro forma down in the exam hall because pro forma doesn't award you any marks. I spent time to explain to you why that does not work. So make sure that in case you missed yesterday's lecture or you have not watched it, you can check it out on the channel. I'm going to link that as well in the description to this video so you'll be able to get access to that. So we went through the issue in relation to the fact that we need to establish a group structure, number one. Number two, we need to look at the net assets of the subsidiary. Number three, we need to deal with any uh, non-controlling interest, goodwill calculation, number three. And then number four, any goodwill calculation will have to be done. And then, uh, did I miss that? Number one, group structure. Number two, net assets of the subsidiary. Number three, goodwill calculation. Number four, uh, non-controlling interest, if there is any. And then number five, the group retained earnings at the end of the day. But we stated that during, uh, through all those five stages that we're going to go through, any intra-group trading would have to be cancelled. And that is what I'm going to be dropping on today. So you're going to make sure that you stay with me carefully as we navigate through this discussion towards understanding everything we need to know about consolidated financial statements. So we saw the group structure yesterday, the simple group structure for the financial reporting students, and then the complex group structure for the corporate reporting, as well as advanced financial management students. So we want to go to the next computation, and that is going to be uh, step two, certainly. That is the net asset of the subsidiary. The net asset of the subsidiary. So this is going to be something very critical that you need to understand when it comes to dealing with the net asset of the subsidiary. Now, why do we need the net asset of the subsidiary? So that we can do the various adjustments in relation to that. Now, remember, I'm doing a major lecture here, meaning that I'm going to be touching on the corporate reporting guys as well as the financial reporting guys. So on the asset, net asset schedule, we're going to do it for the complex group, okay? We're going to do it.
Right. So let's continue with the principles in the net asset schedule. And I'm going to do it on the complex group structure level. Okay. So financial reporting students, you're going to be doing just for one entity. But a corporate reporting student will do for the two entities if it is a complex group structure. And now I want you to stay with me carefully here because you see, um, this workings will be done if the examiner requests that we prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. Stay with me very carefully. If the examiner requests or the requirement of the question is to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position, then we have to look at what? The net asset of the subsidiary. But if the examiner asks us to only uh, calculate or prepare the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, then there is no need for us to do this particular work. So in as much as you must know the process that we go through, you have to understand when to do what. Like yesterday, I illustrated to you about the IAS 28 investment and associates that if we were doing the consolidated statement of financial position, that is where the workings we did yesterday will appear. But if we are doing the consolidated statement of profit or loss, definitely we're not going to be doing all of that in that case. So you've got to be careful when to do what and when not to do what in that case. So net assets of the subsidiary. So we're going to do it, uh, like I mentioned, two subsidiaries because the corporate fronting guys will also be coming up there. So let's do it, two subsidiaries. Let's say we are having Guillermo and then Shandaba. You remember yesterday we used uh, these two companies for our illustration, Guillermo and then Shandaba. Let me make sure if I am in the frame. Okay, very good there. So what do we do? We are going to have two cash columns under each of these guys. Two cash columns under each of these guys. And please stay with me carefully here. Yeah? Okay? So, as always, we're going to start with the cheap things. So, we just go to the statement of financial position given to us in the question. Then we go to the subsidiary. And then we're going to pick uh, their share capital. Wait. I think... Before the cash columns, I need to do a position and a tier end. That is what will represent uh, the cash columns. So at a position, a tier end, that's what is representing the cash columns. At a position, a tier end. So I'm assuming, let's assume we just work in million dollars. Okay, so at a position at the end. Now, sometimes people bring movement, whatever. I don't do that, but it's a, it's a working, so you can decide to do that if you want to do that, all right? But let's go. So we bring share capital of the subsidiary. Now, remember, uh, share capital of the subsidiary at the date of acquisition, when we acquire them, will be the same as the reporting date, so the same figure will come at the reporting date. For corporate reporting, guys, if we have a complex group structure, then this is going to be the sub-subsidiary. And I want you to stay with me carefully on that. So we're going to have the sub-subsidiaries also, share capital coming in. Financial reporting students, you will not have two subsidiaries. You will have only one subsidiary, financial reporting students. These two, these are subsidiaries for corporate reporting students, so please take care. Then, if they have any share premium, why not bring it up? Okay. Then, the work is going to start. We're going to bring fair value adjustments. Fair value adjustments. Please listen carefully. Listen carefully. In the exam world, the examiner, among other things, will be making two statements relating to the fair value adjustment of assets. And I want you to be careful about what goes on about fair value adjustments. One, 
the examiner can sound like this, saying that at the date of acquisition, the fair value of assets of the subsidiary are equal to their current amount with the exception of a land or with the exception of land which has a fair value in excess of or which has a fair value above the current amount of whatever. So the examiner can make a language in excess of or above. Then he can add also the same scenario, but he will say has a fair value below. Okay? So it is either above or below. Now, what is the meaning of that? If in the footnotes, the examiner tells us that the entity's assets, net assets at the date of acquisition are equal to their fair value with the exception of land, which has a fair value in excess of a certain amount, it tells you that the subsidiary had understated their assets. So when you see excess or above, it tells you that the subsidiary had understated its assets. So where the subsidiary has understated its assets, it means that what do we do? We're going to add it back in the net asset schedule. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. So I'm going to assume that that was the land, or uh, let me say plant or whatever. So that excess boy will be added. Will be added. Now assuming sub-subsidiary Shandaba also has that, we're going to bring the same amount. But look at the opposite side. Anytime there is that above, which means they had understated their assets, if the assets are depreciable assets, what it then means is that they have charged depreciation less than they are supposed to charge for the year ended. Let's take that again. Where we have fair value in excess or above, it means that the entity had understated its net assets. If the entity had understated its assets, where the assets are depreciable assets, that means the entity has also understated the amount of depreciation charged for the year ended. For that reason, the examiner is going to give us the economic, the remaining useful life at the date of acquisition. Then we will calculate the additional depreciation for the post-acquisition period. Does it make sense? Let me know in the comment box. So we calculate the additional depreciation. Sometimes it is called excess depreciation. And this covers the post-acquisition period. Please note that depreciation comes to the year end and that will be negated. The depreciation comes to the year end and that will be negated. Why? Because they have charged less depreciation than they are supposed to have charged. So right now, this excess we must calculate the depreciation on that excess as well. Does it make sense? Stay with me carefully on that. Now, not only do we have above, so this is plant and it is an above scenario, but let's say there is another thing, building, and that one is below, okay? So, first item, second item, building, that one is below. Now, when you hear the language below, it means that the entity had overstated its assets. Okay? It means the subsidiary in question had overstated its assets. Non-current Hello? 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 Now, non-current assets cannot be carried over their recoverable amount. So if they have overstated their assets,
We're good? We're good? Okay. So if they had overstated their assets, what do we do? We're going to deduct it. So when you read the language and it is um, at the date of acquisition, the net asset of the subsidiary uh, have their fair value equal to the current amount with the exception of building, which has uh, the fair value below an amount. We bring it. Now, below means they have overstated, so we're going to deduct. We're going to deduct. Now, Shandaba, I'm not bringing anything there, but the same idea will come under Shandaba, okay? If it is below, copy reporting guys. Copy reporting students, okay? If it is a complex group, then we are going uh, to that in relation to that. Then, we come to below. Once it is below like this, it means that there has to be what? Depreciation at the end of the day. Because they have overstated their assets. If they overstated their assets, it means they have also overstated depreciation for the year. Hence, we will calculate the post-acquisition depreciation, and this time around, we will add it back to the profit. So, excess depreciation that they have charged will be brought, and it is for the post-acquisition period. Note that that will always come at the end of the year, and we will add. At the end of the year, and we will add. That is the idea in relation to that. I'm getting some comments coming in. Let me see. Carlos said, is it just me? Uh, camera is not clear. Slow motion viewing. Um, really? I don't know, maybe my network is messing me up today. Come on now. Let's see the feedback real quick here. I think my, my network, it's not my camera. I don't know, sometimes this network companies just want to mess us up now. Is the network um, something like that? What do I have to do? Okay, it's fine now. I'm getting a feedback that it's fine now from Carlos, all right? Everybody else good? Let me know, everybody else good? Can we go? Let's see if I have to change the network. We're good now. Are we clear now? Okay, I see a question coming in from Ali J. Um, Ali J. Koroma said, then how can you treat the depreciation? Then how can you treat the depreciation? Which depreciation, Ali, if you can clarify, which depreciation are you talking about? If you can clarify real quick, then I'll be able to pick you up uh, from there. Okay, I'm seeing that Kennedy Onyango said yet, sir. Uh, number 25 said uh, it's now good. Carlos said not clear, but we can hear. Uh oh. Samuel Godfrey said, yeah, continue. Give me a moment, let me see if I can just uh, change the network or something like that.
Hello? Hello? We're good. Uh, am I clear now? Clearer now? I think I've tried to change the network to see if we can be better now. So let me know in the chat box if uh, you can see uh, clearer now. If you can see my bot clearer now, let me know in the chat box real quick. Let me know in the chat box real quick. Uh, try to change the network to see if we can uh, get somewhere. Sometimes this network just would want to mess you up. Okay, so Carlos said it's perfect now. Okay, Kennedy said it's perfect now. Okay, okay, so let's zoom back real quick. Yeah, so let me pick the questions uh, there. Ali said, can you treat, then how can you treat the depreciation? That is why the post acquisition excess depreciation it's been added back to the profit, okay? Because they have overcharged depreciation, meaning their profit for the year will fall. So what do we do? We add it back. So in as much as when they understated the depreciation was uh, less, and we would deduct it, when they are uh, overstate, then they charge more depreciation, then we would have to what? Add it back in relation to that. So, uh, Coroma, I hope I have answered your question in that case. Henry Tete said, Sir, so what about excess depreciation? How is it treated? And how different is that from carrying amounts understated? Now, in the context of consolidated financial statements, the issue about, you see, the two scenarios are all going to be excess depreciation. But then, where do you add, where do you subtract? It will, base, it will be based on the statement the examiner is what? Making. That is why I said, if it says excess or above, meaning they have understated their assets, so you add it. Now, when you add it, then in that case, the additional depreciation or the excess depreciation would have to be deducted. But if they say below, it means that the entity had understated, sorry, had overstated its assets, hence they had overcharged the depreciation for the year under consideration. Hence, the post acquisition depreciation excess will be added back to the profits of the organization. So I'm not getting your context of the question. Maybe if you can contextualize your question much better for me, I will be able to answer you better in that case. Senior Kewawa said, I have a question on income tax. Yeah, what is it? You can put it in the chat box and then I could uh, look at it for you. Okay, so let's go. Carlos said, said, sometimes they don't actually give us the retained earnings at acquisition. I find it a problem in getting the post acquisition from no starting point. Now, uh, if you say, yes, sometimes you could not be given the retained earnings, but whatever it is, the context of the question will guide you in relation to that because um, I even did not bring that in my pro forma, 
like in the beginning here, that is supposed to be uh, injected in there. I don't know why I forgot that. So retain earnings could be here, okay? Could be here, and you bring the retain earnings at acquisition, then the retain earnings at the reporting date. Now, listen carefully in that case. Listen carefully in that case. As you are saying that sometimes they don't give you the retain earnings at acquisition, now, Nine out of ten, the examiner will give you the retain earning at acquisition. It is a retain earning at year end that you would have to derive from the statement of financial position for the organization. Okay, because nine out of ten that should be given to you. If not, then when you finish with whatever adjustments, the examiner will give you the net asset at acquisition so that the balancing figure will become the retain earnings. Okay, so in that case then the examiner will give you the total net asset at acquisition. So if he gives you the total net asset at acquisition, after your adjustment, then the balancing figure will become what? The retail earnings in relation to that. So that is the idea about the treatment of uh, retail earnings in that case. Okay? That's the idea about that. Henry said, Sir, I understand fair value adjustment must be treated by including additional depreciation. What if the fair value is less than the net asset carrying amount? That is where we are saying below. If the fair value is less than the carrying amount, that is where we are saying below. Because they have overstated their assets. So if they have overstated their assets, what do we do? We add it back. Sorry, we subtract it in that case. That is why the excess depreciation would have to be added back in relation to that. So, uh, Henry Tete, what the question you're asking is about the below concept. When your carrying amount or your fair value is less than the carrying amount, it means it is below. So since it is below, they have overstated the asset, so we're gonna be subtracting it, so that in that case, the post acquisition depreciation would have to be added to the year end. I get it. So let me know, uh, Henry, if you are okay now. Carlos said, uh, thank you so much. Okay. Right, so let's move on with the rest of the issues real quick. Uh, now, let me know if there are any other questions about this so that we get it clear in that case. Okay, so Henry said it's clear now. All right, that is fine. So let's continue. Ghost said, uh, please touch on intercompany transaction involving the sub subsidiary. I am coming there, so you stay with me. So aside this adjustment of um, at year start and at year end, I don't know what is going on with my networks today because I'm still having some negative feedback here. Even I've changed to the network that I know that I could trust them. Can you imagine that? My goodness. What am I going to do now? I just don't know why today my network's just messing up. Vodafone messing up. MTN messing up. Just don't get it. Oh my goodness. My view is still not clear at all. Because when it happens that way, nothing is. Yeah, Mary, oh, uh, I just did that, but I just don't know. 
I just switched off, switched on again, but still, all the networks are just misbehaving. Uh, let me get this done. Hi, we good? Um, we good? Let me know in the comment box uh, if we good. I just don't know. Let me know in the comment box if we good. I see a comment. Uh, Mary O said better. Kennedy said very clear. Carlos said it's clear, but we lost audio. Please let me know if you can hear my audio now. Can you hear my audio? Is it clear? Like, is my sound good now? And my uh, visibility also good? Okay, so Carlos said, yes, all it's good. All right. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to just sustain and finish with this. Right, so um, any, other, any other questions about this, please put it in the chat box, and then let me answer them 
real quick as we continue with the discussion. Okay, Mary O said audio good. That's awesome. Right, so let's go real quick. Now, so aside this plant over or under, there are a couple of other adjustments also that we need to look out for. Like, for instance, some pre-acquisition adjustments that we would have to look out for. Now, when we say pre-acquisition adjustment, for instance, this one, I'm going to just do an uh, illustration on it. I call them pre-acquisition uh, adjustments. For instance, if the company that we are acquired, for some reason, uh, right off borrowing cost. You know, in accordance with IAS 23, borrowing cost is supposed to be capitalized. But if for some reason the entity had been writing it off due to their local laws in their jurisdiction, when the parent entity acquires the subsidiary, we have to let the subsidiary use the group's accounting policy. For that reason, the borrowing cost that they had written off will be capitalized. I hope you are getting the idea. So that these are some of the things that I call pre-acquisition uh, adjustments. So if there is anything that they have done that they are not supposed to have done, wh when we acquire them, we need to adjust their net assets. And those kind of things always happen at the date of acquisition. And it will be either an addition or subtraction. It will be either an addition or subtraction so listen to this carefully they have capitalized on expenses they are supposed to write it off so it means they have overstated their assets so what do we do we come and deduct they have written off on expenses that they are supposed to capitalize what does that mean it means that they have understated their assets so what do we do we add it back so these kind of adjustments may be in the footnotes and you treat those things as an adjustment on the at acquisition net assets. At acquisition net assets. I hope you get that very well. Now, aside this, we come to the next idea, and that is provision for unrealized profit. Provision for unrealized profits. Provision for unrealized profits. Now, when we talk about provision for unrealized profit, you will bring this workings here. Please stay with me very carefully. Stay with me very carefully. If we, we will bring provision for unrealized profit here, if and only if the subsidiary sells to the parent or the sub-subsidiary sells to the parent, or one of them sells to the other. If the parent is the one selling to any of these guys, post-acquisition profit goes to the group retained earnings and not the net assets. Let's take that again. Provision for unrealized profits comes in here if the subsidiary is the one selling to the parent or sub-subsidiary selling to the parent. But if the parents doing the selling, post-acquisition profit does not come here. And I wanted to make sure you get that very well. So, dealing with post-acquisition profit can, can arise from two things, generally. So, the post-acquisition profit can be because of transfer of assets. Okay? Or... It could be sold of goods. Now, if the subsidiary during the post acquisition period transfers an asset to the parent company, and definitely they will transfer it at a profit. So let's say that the current value of the asset was, say, uh, $20,000, but they sold the asset to the parent company at, say, um, how much? Let's say $22,000. Meaning that on the disposal, they made a profit of how much? $2,000. Now, 
In the group financial statement, one of the things you need to understand is that all intra-group trading must be eliminated. All intra-group trading must be eliminated. So if we are treating the two entities as one, then you cannot profit over me. You cannot make money at my expense. You cannot say that you've made any profit because you really haven't made any profit. So this $2,000 becomes what we refer to as the post, sorry, the provision for unrealized profit. And in that case, Guillermo, who was selling to the parent entity, we're going to be deducting that from the year end. So post acquisition profit always comes to the year end. Now, you got to be careful about this very well. Got to be careful about this very well. If the subsidiary sold the asset to the parents like that, that means that in the parents' books, they are carrying the asset at 22,000, even though they are supposed to carry the asset at what? 20,000. So, in their separate financial statements, they will account for it correctly. But when we come to the group level, we must eliminate what? The uh, intra-group trading. For that reason, the parent entity will be charging more depreciation than it was supposed to have charged. TNEA, stay with me carefully. Because they should have charged depreciation using the current value, but they will be charging depreciation using the value at which they bought the asset, the fair value in their books. So meaning that, the parent has also charged more depreciation than it was supposed to have charged. For that reason, excess depreciation would have to be added back to the group retained earnings. Did you get that well? Right. So that is provision for realized profit on transfer of assets. Now, the reverse is true. If the parent was the one selling to the SAP, if the parent was the one selling to the SAP, then any provision for unrealized profit will not be treated in the net asset. Instead, will be treated in the group retained earnings in relation to that. Sir, so please touch on, on wood interest and how it will be treated. Now, that could, that I'll be coming to that. That will be another item about liability that I would want to share my thoughts on. So stay with me. I'll be coming to that in a moment. So... That is about the transfer of assets. But what you're going to be very common about is the sale of goods. Again, if the parent sells goods, sorry, if the subsidiary sells goods to the parent, then at the end of the day, the parent has some of the goods in stock. Okay? So subsidiary sells the goods to the parent, but then at the end of the accounting period, or as at the end of the accounting period, the parent still has some of the goods in stock. Meaning that on the consolidated level, the subsidiary hadn't made a profit yet. So for that, for that reason, we're going to calculate the provision for what? On realized profit on the goods outstanding as at the reporting date in the books of the parents, which they bought from the subsidiary. Then in that case, the provision for realized profit will also be calculated. Please note that if it is goods in transit, okay, if it is goods in transit, the same thing happens here. So usually provision for realized profit will be computed on two things. One, the ones that they have not yet finished selling, which they bought from the subsidiary or from the other company, and then any goods that is in transit, and we'll come to that later on when we are dealing with generally cancellation and treatment of the current account. So, whatever goods that they are selling, subsidiary sells to the parent, and the parent hasn't finished selling all those goods as a reporting date, provision for realized profit is going to be created on that for the company in that case. So that is the idea about the provision for unrealized profit. So note, it is coming here because the subsidiary is selling to the parent. The subsidiary is selling to the parent. And it could be an asset 
or it could be goods that we are selling in relation to that. So what about provision for unrealized profits will be brought at the year end for the subsidiary in that case. I will come back to note uh, three, which is dealing with intra-group trading and give you the principles all in general. But here, I just want you to understand that if the subsidiary sells to the parents, at the end of the year, if it's about an asset, whatever provision for realized profits that they made would have to be uh, taken out because on the group level, they are not supposed to make that. Then if it is goods and still the parent has some of the goods in stock, then as of the reporting date, we need to calculate the provision for realized profit and then bring it uh, back to come and deduct it in relation to that. Now, so let me know in the comment box uh, if everybody understands the treatment of the provision for realized profit, the transfer of the assets and the goods. Very, very important in that case. So I see a comment coming in from uh, Leonard Montali said, uh, hi, bro, please start on wound of companies. When you say wound of companies, are you talking about liquidation of companies, something like that? Let me know in the comment box. Now, apart from provision for unrealized profit, there could be other items like provisions, like liabilities. Now, technically, that could be part of their pre-acquisition issues. So maybe, for instance, at the date of acquisition, we realized that they were supposed to, uh, they have a liability which has not been included in their books or which they have not provided for in their books. So now, we need to provide for it. So usually, those kind of Provisions that they have not provided for usually will come at the start of the year, come at the end of the year, and it will be negated. Why? Because provision is a liability. Provision is a liability, so you're going to deduct it from the two cases in relation to that. Then if there is any unwinding interest expenses, then we will do the adjustment and bring it at the end of the year just like how you do for the depreciation in that case. So basically, when it comes to the net assets of the subsidiary, these are a number of things that we need to look out for in that case. So retain earnings, share capital, share premium, nine out of 10, these are directly stated in the question. So you just going to pick them up straight up. Uh, fair value adjustment will be in your footnotes. You read it well, whether it is above or below, know the treatment. Then, as uh, when it's above or below and it's a depreciable asset, know how to deal, the, deal with the opposite aspect. Now, let me say this. The difference between the at acquisition, the difference between the depreciation and this goes to the statement of financial position. Okay, the difference. Because if, if we go to the face of the statement of financial position, this minus this will go there. The same thing happens to the case if it is below. That minus this also will be going there to go and deduct in relation to that. So when you go to the face of the statement of financial position, you bring the parent figure, you bring the subsidiary figure, then this fair value adjustment will be taken there as well for the organization. Then certainly, if there are any pre-acquisition adjustments, we uh, do that for the company in that case. Now, so after that, after that, we add it up, add it up, add it up, add it up. And that's going to be net assets. So we're going to have net assets to the acquisition, net assets at the reporting date. Then for Shandaba, the subsidiary, net assets net asset at acquisition, net assets 
at the reporting date. Now, John Makuri said, tomorrow I'm sitting for financial reporting here in Tanzania. Kindly help me on how to deal with preferred, preferred stock and bond, which are included in acquired uh, subsidiary. That will come in if I'm dealing with the issue in relation to uh, calculation of goodwill and all that. But uh, preferred stock or preference stocks is a form of liability. So that will be actually deducted when we are dealing with the issue in relation to the uh, net assets. Now, the net asset at acquisition will be used in the computation of our goodwill. Okay? So we will use the net asset at acquisition in the computation of goodwill. Then, then the difference between the net asset at acquisition and the net asset at year end is called the post acquisition profit or loss. Okay? The difference between at, the, at acquisition and at year end is called the post acquisition profit or loss. Post acquisition profit or loss. So this post acquisition profit or loss will be used when dealing with the non controlling interest at the reporting date and then. Uh, dealing with the group retained earnings or the consolidated retained earnings in relation to that. So that is the idea about the net asset. Please note, this workings will be done if we are preparing the consolidated statement of financial position. If you are not preparing the consolidated statement of financial position and you are preparing just the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, and the examiner asks you to calculate goodwill, then you will only need the net asset at the date of acquisition. You don't have to do at acquisition at year end because you don't need that. So this particular working will only be done where we are required to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. So that is the treatment about the second thing, the net asset. Any questions for me? Any questions for me, real quick? Any questions for me? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to conclude around here today for time constraint purposes so that tomorrow we will look at the final parts of this discussion to conclude on the uh, thing. One of the critical areas in the exam hall where there is a standard question waiting for you on that is the calculation of goodwill, which is the next working we're going to be doing tomorrow. So make sure that you will join me same time tomorrow as we look at the computation of the goodwill. That is going to be critical because now that you have your next asset, how do you calculate the goodwill? Especially for the people doing corporate reporting, there is a way goodwill has to be calculated, taking into consideration the sub subsidiary. Then for those of you doing FR also, there is a way goodwill has to be calculated, determination of the fair value of consideration, there are four things that are included in that, and there is a way they have to be treated. And so I'm going to be touching on those principles as well uh, tomorrow as we conclude on uh, the discussion on the principles relating to consolidated financial statements. So thank you very much for joining the stream. It's always a pleasure coming your way. And uh, we're going to continue the same time tomorrow. 4.30 p.m. GMT uh, as we continue with our discussion towards the ICAD November 2020 examination. Please note, however, that our executive revision masterclass is coming on next week uh, and it's limited for a selected few people who will be interested to go 
that for the extra amount to be able to prepare well for the examination. So thank you very much. It's always a pleasure coming your way. I'm going to come again same time tomorrow as we continue with our discussion towards the November 2020 examination. So for all of you guys who join us on who join on YouTube as well as on Facebook, thank you very much. Most importantly, a big thanks and God bless you to the people who smash the like button and share the video so we can reach as many students as possible. I love you so much and thank you for the support. So catch me same time tomorrow, 4.30 GMT, as we continue with our discussions and conclude on the principles of consolidation in that case. So let's see, seeing some comments coming in. Let me see if we can touch on them real quick. Richard said, I enjoyed the class. Keep it up. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Jonas said, thanks. Thank you for today. All right. Mary O said, thank you. Always a pleasure, Mary. Carlos said, said uh, last question. Some expenses are only adjustable to the post acquisition profit uh, before uh, proportioning for NCI. What are the expenses that only affect the post acquisition uh, profit? The expenses that affect post acquisition profit relates to the expenses that occurred during the post acquisition profit, like the depreciation. That is why it is under post acquisition profit, like provision for unrealized uh, profit. That is why we bring it under the post acquisition profit. And then sometimes when there is impairment in uh, the company as a whole, the subsidiary as a whole, we will be able to also deduct that in the post acquisition profit before we will share the balance between the parents and then the non-controlling interest in that case. So expenses that are adjustable in the post acquisition profit relates to expenses that actually occur in the post acquisition profit. Carlos Robert said, I will ask my question tomorrow. Thank you for all uh what you've done okay thank you very much right so thank you for joining the stream it's always a pleasure coming your way like i said continue to uh connect with us share the video with your friends your colleagues on your whatsapp pages on your facebook groups share let's reach as many students as possible and remember to subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed to the channel and click on the bell notification icon that way when i go live you will be the first person to be notified. Remember to also follow me on Instagram because on Instagram, uh, I post there some videos as well as whatever discussions we are going to be doing for the day so that you can have that ahead of time. And if it relates to what you are studying, you will make a date and join me on the stream. So you can also follow me on Instagram at Mishira Premium, the same name on the channel if you're not already following me on Instagram. So thank you very much. I'll see you same time tomorrow as we continue. Until we meet same time tomorrow, stay blessed and stay safe. Bye-bye.